The next speaker is Ahti Salo, who is a graduate of Systems Analysis Laboratory and a professor at the lab since the year 2000. Ahti is also the Vice Dean of the School of Science. His research interests include decision making and risk management. Welcome, Ahti. So, good morning. And I do have a truly challenging title. It's called Understanding Systems of the Future. But before jumping into the future, I thought of quoting a very famous technological icon, Steve Jobs, who died recently. And he's quoted to have said that you cannot connect the dots looking forward you can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. This approach has never let me down and it has made all the difference in my life. And I think that this would be a, mar a wonderful marketing pitch for the course on time series analysis which I was teaching in the lab in the late 80s when I was working on my dissertation under the supervision of Raimo Hamelain. And I also thought of revisiting some of the materials which I used in my course on technology assessment, which I created exactly 15 years ago when I came back to the lab again, then as a professor, after having worked as the project manager for the first technology assessment report for the Finnish parliament. And in that course, I actually looked quite a bit further back in the past, so to speak, drawing upon the materials which I received from a collaborator of mine at the European Joint Research Center. And that was an article called, What May Happen in the Next 100 Years? This, this was published in the year 1900, published in the Ladies' Home Journal, which is not awfully scientific, I regret to say. But nevertheless, the approach which was taken was scientific in that it made use of the expert elicitation approach so that the author, John Alfred Watkins, went to the wisest and most careful men of the greatest institutions of science and learning, asking each to forecast what will have been wrought meaning brought about, a century from now. And the prophecies he thus created would seem strange to him, almost impossible, but they did come from these excellent minds of the time. So let's revisit them. And here are some. Wireless telephone and telegraph circuits will span the world. This is eminently true, as we all know. Similarly, photographs will be telegraphed from any distance, and photographs will reproduce all of nature's colors. Again, I would give excellent marks. Any, I mean, if this was a student report, yes, this was the correct answer. <coughs> However, some statements were not so, let's say, uh, easy to interpret. There was an argument that airships would not successfully compete with surface land and water vessels for passenger or freight traffic. Aviation did exist in terms of balloons, and it was sort of expected. They did have kites, and it was foreseen that they might have aircraft. And in, fa in effect, there are domains where aviation does compete, so there's a question mark. But nevertheless, some success. And some forecasts were evidently wrong, claiming that every single river or creek with any suitable fall would be equipped with water motors turning dynamos making electricity. This is in the realm of environment and energy. And from the viewpoint of pure technical feasibility, it could be the case that we could indeed harness water power to the extent. But I fear that we would thereby lose the pristine nature that we so much love. Therefore, this is not the case. And similarly, 
there was a forecast that mosquitoes, houseflies, and roaches will have been exterminated. <laughs> Raimo mentioned the book on Rachel Carson at the Silent Spring, and indeed there was an attempt in the late 50s to kill all mosquitoes, houseflies, and ro roaches, but fortunately that <coughs> attempt was ceased, and we do, have, we do have the biological diversity. So what insights can we now get in hindsight from forecasts of this nature? And I would say that some of the statements are just uh, optimistic visions of the future. Let's, let's Stay optimistic. Many were strikingly correct, if you read it. I mean, they are, like the one on mobile phones. They were uh, evidently some items, some te technological discontinuities were totally missed, such as fission, energy, transistors, and DNA, because the fundamental scientific discoveries did not exist, and for some, the errors were in the economic viability of technologies, such as in the case of aviation, or in the case of running counter to the aspirations that would offend our values, killing all insects. So now, looking into that, where do we stand now? I mean, assuming that we take on this challenge of looking into the year 2100, where do we stand? Where is the world heading? And I would say that, as Raima noted, we are surrounded, we are embedded in systems, and many of these systems are becoming ever more interconnected and volatile. And here's a diagram which I have taken from uh, the dissertation of a recent doctoral student of mine, Kimo Soramaki, who carried out an analysis of which countries have been loading money to which other countries, so that arcs which are connecting the countries would represent the amount of money that they stand to pay back to each other. Thus helping us understand which countries would stand to, to suffer. For instance, if Greece were to default on its loans, would Finland be there to suffer or not? We are also able to collect and analyze absolutely huge volumes of data. I won't quote the terabytes or whatever, but what is interesting in this pyramid is that actually, if we look at the uh, advanced analytics pyramid, some of the expert judgment approaches would appear perhaps at the very top. And thirdly, we still live in a world where economic and political disruptions occur. Some six years ago, we did have the financial crisis which erupted out of almost nothingness, so to speak, if we look at the credit ratings, and it's still affecting the global economy, very much the Finnish economy too. And many of you are students and perhaps too young to remember that some 25 years ago we had the fall of the Berlin Wall, which radically and suddenly changed the landscape of the political landscape of Eastern Europe. None of this had any, there was no data on this available. And I would now come to the point of arguing that in this changing world, models in effect provide the universal, I'm stressing the word, the universal language for capturing the essence of dynamic systems. They are the means which allow us to combine data where it's available, expert judgments such as those early forecasts, and also value statements in order to help us choose actions for achieving those objectives which allow us to realize our values, be it in the realm of economics, sustainability, ecology, culture, or politics. And I would also point out that these models are actually becoming so pervasive that they may go unnoticed. I bet that practically all of you would go surfing the Google or some other search engine, and they have algorithms of this nature, page rank algorithms and the like. When you take the bus from Otania to Campi, you may be searching the HSL in order to find the shortest route from Otaniemi to 
and there's the shortest route algorithm, which is one of the, the most famous algorithms in, in uh, operations research. And if you drive Sedgeways or other these semi-automated vehicles, they contain loads of automated control algorithms. And at the very other end of the spectrum, they also inform truly far-reaching decisions that impact the lives, not of our own, but those of our children and grandchildren. And here I've taken a diagram from the dissertation of another doctor student of mine, Tommy Ekholm, who did an analysis of what kinds of measures would be cost-effective in mitigating the harmful consequences of climate change in view of the year 2100. And that year is closer to us now than what the year 1900 was in the article of John Watkins. And uh, instead of making, let's say, sure bets, and I fear that I wouldn't even have time for that, but I make a very sure forecast here. And I think the surest forecast that I can make is that there are exciting opportunities for those who possess advanced modeling skills, have an open questioning mind, and wish to mark their contribution by making changes for the better. And this is not only my own point of view, but it's also that of the US Bureau of Labor Statistics who's been looking at the growth in the demand for operations research analyst in the US economy, and I think that the Finnish economy is also pretty advanced, so there is some relevance of this to the Finnish economy as well. And the way by which we, in this lab, create these analysts, analysts is that of education, and I'm quoting here one of the uh, early fighters of the equal rights movement, Malcolm X, who noted that education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who pre prepare it for, for it today. And one excellent opportunity for you to learn more about how this education is being provided, strengthened, and promoted is attending this seminar in this very same lecture hall at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. I would very much hope to see you here. Students don't have to pay anything, except if you wish to have drinks, in which case we would ask you to pay five euros. But, that's, but it's a marginal fee. So please do come. We do have an excellent set of presenters from well-established operations research scholars and practitioners. Thank you.